Hi, and welcome to the Lux Research Videocast. My name is Guillaume Hewege, and I'm a research associate on the Bio-Based Materials and Chemicals team here with my colleague, Victor O. Hi, my name is Victor O. I lead up the Bio-Based Materials and Chemicals team at Lux Research. And again, here with Guillaume to talk a little bit about uh, one of the recent, recent webinars that we gave in January called The New Face of Bio-Based, How Performance Enables Sustainability in Tomorrow's Products. So what do you really mean by performance enabling sustainability? Yeah, so it's a good question. I think the webinar is intended to explore the value proposition of sustainability, right? Because it's a, it's a word that we hear a lot in this industry thrown around. Um, uh, historically, I think what we've seen companies use sustainability as almost a marketing tool. Um, so marketing better products, maybe cleaner or more eco-friendly or, or even greener products. Mm -hmm. um, but we've seen a lot of these products, I think, just really be terrible in terms of performance. Do you have any good examples of these? Yeah, and so <laughs> I actually brought some props with me. Huh. Um, just a few forks. Actually, they're all plastic, right? Um, they may be different in terms of color, in terms of size, it's a little bit of the shape. Um, but it, to illustrate, I guess, this point of, of some of the, the issues with sustainable, quote unquote, sustainable products. Um, a few months ago, I was at a coffee shop and I was eating my muffin, <laughs> ready to eat my muffin, and I'd stuck in the plastic fork uh, into the muffin and it literally just snapped in my hand, right? Um, I brought one of those forks with me to show you. Um, so we have this fork here. Again, plastic, probably conventional plastic. It's pretty durable. You, you can imagine using this on a steak and you'd probably have no problem. Um, similar also to this fork. Um, again, pretty durable. I'm applying a good amount of force here and it's not, it's not breaking. Um, and then here we get to the culprit. <laughs> um, so if I apply a little bit of force, I mean, it, geez, it just snapped in my head, almost even shattered into a few pieces, right? And so that's the experience that I had oh. on a muffin, right? Not even on a steak, not on a, on a table or a rock. It yeah. was something as soft as a muffin. And so uh, for me, it was my personal experience to see, you know, it didn't surprise me then that uh, these kinds of bio-based plastics are only about one to 2% of the total market share for conventional plastics right. globally, right? Um, and a lot of these issues is not the fact that they're renewable or the fact that they are quote unquote more sustainable, it's the fact that they just don't perform. Hmm. Um, so we're starting to see an emergence of a new class of bio-based materials and chemicals, which we call uh, um, improvements, right. right? In a class of improvements. And so examples like biopolymers that actually have better properties is polyethylene furanoid or PEF. And we're seeing examples like Coca-Cola and Netherlands-based Avantium develop packaging using this advanced polymer. Um, another example of some of these improvement materials and chemicals um, is advanced materials like synthetic spider silk or nanocrystalline cellulose, um, again, that have either improved properties or unique properties that are, that are inherent because of its bio-based nature. I know it's, a, it's an area that you've been following closely in the past right. few months, and um, what, maybe what are some of the, the interesting applications or areas that you, you find the use of these improvement materials and chemicals? Yeah, so I mean, as you said, packaging is really one of the, to me, the easiest uh, applications to get into because, again, mm -hmm. it doesn't have as strenuous uh, performance barriers to get into it. Um, again, for something like a chips bag here, <laughs> where you, know, you don't need a lot of you know, mechanical stress um, you know, to undergo these materials, um, it's pretty easy for something that is poor performing to get in. And you know, there's also an opportunity for more sustainable materials to kind of replace these aluminum lined plastic bags which can't be recycled. Um, again, the aluminum is there for improved barrier properties. And so if you could develop kind of a plastic that doesn't require this bag or this layer, then you know, that would have a very good value proposition. So what's a, maybe a good example or even a bad example historically? Yeah, so I companies? think a historically a bad example, um, a few years back, Sunships tried to use a PLA bag. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it didn't have this in inner aluminum lining, and so it was actually compostable. But one of the issues, again, it performed well mechanically, but you know, as loud as this crinkling is, their bag was incredibly loud, and there are a lot of videos and Facebook pages <laughs> just kind of making fun of how loud the Sunships bag was. So I think that's an interesting point, right? Because it actually looks at not just quantifiable performance, right? right. Metrics like maybe better barrier properties that you can actually quantify or, or measure, um, maybe even tensile strength right. or elasticity. A lot of these materials actually have, have really quantifiable Mm -hmm. improved performance, but right. noise is not something maybe you can quantify by decibels, but it's almost a qualitative aspect. Right. It's very difficult to quantify the noise requirements for a product. Sure. Right? So I think it gets to, it, it's 
nice because we talk about this and it's one of the three main uh, right. takeaways from the webinar, right? Where it's not only the first step of identifying a material or chemical that has better imp imp you know, performance or mm -hmm. improved properties. That's obviously step one. Um, I identifying maybe a, a different class or, or a different range of potential materials and chemicals you can use in your product. Right. I, I think the next follow-up step really is though to look at the applications or being able to integrate and implement those better properties into your product and also not only focus on just the, the, the quantifiable properties but right. also the qualitative properties. Right. One example um, just quickly is uh, the use of synthetic spider silk we're starting to see in, in consumer products like, like athletic shoes or even you know, expedition parkas, right? Um, where obviously the, the better strength of this fiber um, is useful and is a quantifiable, uh, I guess, performance aspect, but actually even the color and natural color of a fiber in one of the prototype and commercially launched products, I think this year is, is when they're coming out, uh, the North Face Moon Parka which uses synthetic spider silk, actually has a gold color to it. Huh. And they don't dye the material. It's actually just a natural color of that synthetic spider silk. And so we're starting to see not only is the incorporation of the application of that particular material in um, an actual concrete application, um, but it's not just using quantifiable, but also qualitative oh, aspects. Right. Um, so, you know, identify your, your material and chemical with improved performance, then the winners will, be, will really be the ones that are actually incorporating those improved properties into concrete applications, into in products. And then really the last aspect is that these companies won't be doing this alone, right? So it's gonna be very difficult, it'll take many years and a lot of money for one company to identify a material and chemical, then to scale that up, then to actually test it in products, then actually market and, and, and launch that product. Um, so we see the importance really of strategic partnerships and closing the value chain right. with experts at each step, right? So, you know, Coca-Cola, for example, with, with the previous example that we talked about, P, the use of PEF, a bioplastic, with improved properties over conventional PET, um, they have partnerships filled out on, on, on the value chain, right? So all the way up in terms of the different sugars they need to make, you know, eventually the, the, the right. bioplastic, they have a partnership with Terios. Um, then they have a van team in the middle as kind of the technology provider to, cat to catalyze really the sugars into uh, FDCA, one of the precursors needed for polyethylene furanoid. Right. And then they have BASF, which uh, recently announced a joint venture with a van team to scale up really the process right. for uh, producing PEF at scale. And then Coca-Cola, kind of the consumer facing product development expert that can then take this advanced, you know, polymer um, or with improved properties and incorporate it into an actual product for consumers. And so we see a nice example of um, really closing the value chain and strategic partnerships there. So that sounds really cool, Victor. So if I wanted to learn more about the topics on the webinar, what should I do? Yep, so you can find the webinar um, and really some of our uh, certain different services as well as uh, research on the website, uh, www.luxresearchinc.com. Um, as well as you'll, you'll find uh, the, the webinar on, on the and future videocasts on the website as well. So yeah, thanks for your time today. Thanks, Victor. Yep.